Welcome everyone to tonight's SEC Sundown event titled Effective COVID Management Strategies in a Growth Stage Startup. My name is Raphael Strauss and I work at the Sassin Sustainability Entrepreneurship Center as the Content Strategy Manager. Please allow me to give a short introduction to our host of the evening, Surat Sam from your team. He is the director of the Sassin SEC as well as the executive director of the Bank of Venture Club. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Also, please let me welcome uh, our speaker today, uh, Kun Nam Phon. Um, she is the Zenium's Thailand Managing Director. And after an early start in the biotech sector, she transitioned into the ad tech sector where she joined Tapioca, uh, sorry, Topeka Ad Tech Group, Southeast Asia's largest online edu education ecosystem. And after leaving her last latest post as a deputy sales director, um, she furthered Oyo's, the world's fastest growing and second largest hotel chain business development effort until she joined Senium last year and rose in only nine months to her current role. Welcome, Nam Phon. Thank you. Yeah, with that, I would like to hand over the mic to you, Sam, and then wish everybody an insightful and pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks so much for the intro, Raphael. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone, once again. Thanks so much for joining. And thank you, most of all, Kunum uh, Phon, for, for joining us. I've been really excited to, to have this conversation with you today. So you've... Um, just to, to maybe start on a more, a little bit informal level and get to, to, to share a bit of your background more broadly. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey just from a, a general personal level and then leading up to, to Zenium? Mm, sure, so I like from what I'm doing now, actually not so much related like in, in you know, in medtech startup or like managing director, like in business way, because I actually graduated from biotechnology, um, like was specialized in like ferment tech and nanopolymers, those kind of things. And then was like a researcher in like a center research center for a few years. And, and then after a while we found out that um, we, I think we found out that uh, like in Thailand, we, if I can convert like um, combine science and business together, we might be able to cross hack in like in terms of business or even my own career. So after after I I've been I was racing for a year and then I found that okay maybe I should join MBA like a fast track MBA for a year and then try to explore. So with that um, back there like five six years ago in Thailand startup community in Thailand quite small right so we I went to a lot of startup events hackathon those kind of things and then found like feel kind of comfortable with people there and then maybe it's my place so I started to to join some few startup in Thailand first and then I figured out um, that moment that that not much Thai startup that success at this rate like this day so I decided to to join startup in Vietnam and Topica there and then with that um, I got a very really growth hack in terms of career like we started with uh, marketing, then rotate to operation, finance, HR, or even IT related project within three years. So, so after that, I got a chance to to focus in sales. So back to Thailand after a year, and then back to Thailand and focus in sales for a year. And then that's how I really started my my whole career in um, sales management, and then grow further in terms of like a business development, even in Oyo. And then I had a chance to. Um, I met um, founders in here with Julian, so I actually got the um, opportunities there, and then I can start here in sales. Actually, head of sales first, and then I mm -hmm. I got promoted to become managing director in Senyum. Yeah, but that moment I decided to join Senyum because I think it's the COVID already started actually like last year. Um, but I see that medical or like dentistry thing is not have that much disruption yet in Thailand. So I think it's a very good opportunity to, to create that kind of environment in Thailand, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an amazing journey. You've, you've had a lot of experience in many different, both functional roles uh, as well as in sort of industry uh, context as well, which comes in, I would imagine, really handy to, to head towards what's ultimately, or at least for this moment, really a general management role. Right, so it seems like you, you're combining a lot of those things. And again, you said you started from essentially hard science, 
Yes. All right, deep tech. And then from there into things like marketing, finance, uh, account, um, sales, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's like a, a tour of all the things that a general manager would sort of need to know. So just, just curious, how, was, it, was it deliberate? Was it sort of a strategic thing or how much of it was sort of just improv in life <laughs> throwing things at you or how much was it uh, on purpose? Yeah, it, it was some was on purpose. This one ha actually have to thanks to Topica back then. It's somewhat like management training, but it's not like that. It's what more like project management. So mm. I have to taking care in operation works and also have to develop the project as well from the current process. So that's why I have to dig very deep and become a fast learner to, to kick off and achieve the project increase. That's how I, I can like grow very fast there. Mm -hmm. And um uh leading up to here do you, do you see any patterns of of how it's it's the journey has helped to 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 do what you're doing today you see see some connections and sort of dots that are formed uh, connecting the dots if you will um i think the main dot would be when when they have to back at least sales team with like 40 like you know 40 tele sales that time and i didn't have any sales background at all but every people like top the top management in topic it was like i i feel that you can do sales very well but i'm like i never do sales before <laughs> uh, and then they're like okay i believe in you i'm gonna send you back to thailand and lead this sales team wow so, so it was like um a big opportunity as well as like a big challenge you know i cried for three months that like because I got a lot of resistance from current sales and they very top sales mm. and also with the sales managers as well. So we have to um, build my new team, prove a lot of concepts and everything. So within six months, um, we, we, I, me and the team really made achievement to grow the market by then. So we became like a scale, like almost two times in, in six mm. months. So wow. it's, it's quite, so, so after a, a rocky road, so I, I, I think I got the, a lot of best practice how to do sales like rental sales from there yeah so this this is really inspiring to hear and might might be useful for for anyone out there who's um you know in in the relevant part of their career where, where this could come in handy right um so you you were thrown into positions where you you were basically starting from scratch so in that example there it was sales and yet you did it you know and and so any any sort of advice there for someone who's in that position or fuel to like build their confidence so, so they can can be more hopeful and and attack it you know more positively yeah. so i actually have um my own best practice is not have to be sales so every time i start thing so i i will try to understand a whole structure on how they do it like it can start it from organization chart or the process and everything and it go through all data that we have or they have if they don't have that data, maybe just build it and then try to understand the whole situation with numbers and then we can really monitor the trends and everything. So that, that's how I think I, it made me able to cope with the situation and make it able to grow very fast because um, the way I run sales is not about tactics. It's all about numbers. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's very, it's very logical. If anything, maybe we can see a connection right there from your sort of science and almost engineering type of background that feeds into it because it's the way of thinking, right? It's not necessarily the exact sciences that you're using, but just the way the brain works, so to speak. And you can, you see, you sound, sounds like you approached it in that way, very analytical. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, even this yeah, thank you. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and so today we're going to talk just to kind of coming back to the, the larger theme, right? When, one of the big things is certainly uh, it relates to COVID, but in particular, it's managing through COVID crisis situation and from a managerial point of view. So this is great. You know, what we just heard about your background, we can see you. And I know from, from speaking with you before personally, you're very, very um, thoughtful and, and um, focused uh, when it comes to management. You think about people and structures and processes, very, very disciplined. Um, but you've been thrown, you know, the thing that, that all of us have been thrown uh, at us uh, recently is this COVID situation, super difficult, super challenging. 
So before we get into some of the detail of that, just to provide a little context for in case some of the folks who are listening might not be familiar with the particular business that you're in, Zenium, could you please tell us a little bit about what about what it is and what what, what you do? Sure. So um, Zenium is actually a dental product, so a dental care service and uh, oral care product related. Uh, our main product is actually aligners, and now we have sonic toothbrush and also like toothpaste, tooth uh, mouthwash. Those products is coming to Thailand very soon as called Senju Fresh. But right now in Thailand, we have aligners and uh, sonic toothbrush. What, what, what's, so what's for that aligner, that you're, you're saying, sorry, what something liners, uh, aligners, uh, aligners, aligners right? yeah, aligners. Okay. Or uh, like, or uh, uh, some people call invisible braces. Okay. Or uh, like uh, metal braces. Yeah. Got so, uh, with invisible braces or aligners is something quite new, right? Even we, some people might get familiar on seeing this kind of invisible braces few years few years already. Um, but like Senyum, we just started this business three years. This year will be a third year for our business. So how how our product is very differentiated from others is that um, you can, as a consumer, you just need to meet doctors only three times during the whole process of the customer journey. If compared with um, the old way of metal braces, or even in this normal process of invisible braces, you have to meet doctor monthly. And then every time you, you go there, you have to pay time by time, right? And then the cost is going up or not, it's nonstop until doctors or dentists feels like, okay, they're satisfied enough or it's good enough and then they end the treatment there. Mm. So, and, and what with us is that, um, First, we want price to so pay the price one time. Even you have refinement or have to fix the teeth after the treatment plan later, you just have to pay one price, no hidden cost. That's the first thing. Second mm. thing, you meet doctor only three times. First time is like collect your um, teeth um, by scanning or by impression. Second time mm. is that fitting the equipment. The third time is um, follow up to finish the treatment. So the in total would be only three times at max. Uh, unless you have a very difficult case or have to extra follow up would be at another time of follow up, but mostly only two times. That's the, mm -hmm. the difference. So while, while the customer doing the, the um, treatment, right? So they have to track their, their teeth development on application. So our application will help con consumers to monitor how their teeth changing by changing, um, update the pictures every time they changing the braces and also tracking the time, how, how long they wear it. And if any comments or concern, they can just ask right away on the application and we have a customer assistant who will answer that question without, and, and then the consumer or the customer doesn't have to be hesitate to ask doctor, right? So for example, if you wanna go swimming or go diving today, you know, in Phuket and like, should I take it off or should I wear it? You can just click on application and ask our customer care assistant right away. Wow. But in usual case, you'll be like, you be like scared to ask doctor, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. When you just... Or even if you weren't scared, yeah. but it might so, not be convenient to reach them, you know, you can't just call them up and get an answer real quick, right? right? Oh, that's that's great. Right. Just, so, just uh, back you, up. You wanna do this thing? Just just yeah. just backing yeah. up for a moment, though, to to what you described. So a couple a couple things. So when you first so, said with that, um, and oh, sorry, there's a delay. <laughs> Sorry, but I think yeah, I think the connection there was a huge delay. So, so so if if I may ask you again, so coming back, you 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 describe this as um you know uh, aligners or invisible braces. Uh, I I had braces when I was a, a kid, mm -hmm. long long time ago, and I remember that's right. Like you had to go, I had to go and visit the orthodontist quite often. Uh, it was something like monthly. Um, so, so you're saying one of the main value propositions is that that gets compressed down to only three visits, right? So it's a matter of time savings and a, and a form of convenience. Um, also when you say that they're invisible, just, just curious, um, because I remember there was a phase where there are certain braces, there's still the traditional type, but it's like kind of transparent. So it looks sort of like it's invisible, not exactly. But this is different, right? If I understand correctly, they're fundamentally a different type of technology and structure uh, from just the, the, the that type that I was describing. Is that right? 
I, this one we use um, 3D printing technology with um, with um, a special type of um, material to to print out. So it's like uh, customized for for each patient and each state from there. And um, when when we do this method, it's like the with, with metal braces, you is will stuck in the teeth until you finish the treatment, right? This one you can take it off when you have lunch or dinner. You can take it just. Ah. Take it off. So kind of like in a way, when when we had braces um, near the end, there was a phase where we wear something called a retainer. Uh, there's various forms of that, so it has that that quality, which is you can remove it, but it's but it's is it sort of behind the teeth, so you can't really see it, or what? Oh, it's like all all invisible. It's just like um, imagine of normal plastic, right? It's transparent. And, huh. and the thickness is like zero point seven mil, so not even much not even one centimeter so it's very very thin and you and when um we have a test right also like when people speak they don't feel it or like no, but the the list, listener or audience would not notice it, that you're really wearing something because lots of our customers they are like reporters models mm -hmm. or like youtubers so no one really noticed that they're doing it right now because like our, our main um, target is like young adults or working people right and at our age like 30 or like above, they no one wants to have people notice that you're you doing metal braces. So this one would really like um, add up the confidence during and after as well. I see, I see. Well, that's great. Okay. So now coming back to, to kind of our larger theme with COVID, um, how, how just at a broad level for your business overall, how has COVID impacted um, your sort of operations and, and, and the business? So um, let's say it's like kind of different phase of COVID, right? Um, like today, it would be another story from what we prepared like to talk about before already, but um, it's highly impact as everyone. Um, I'm not sure if everyone, but mostly just like every business that got, they got highly impact on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So we we have to change a lot of things uh, the way we run business from from the core to to outside yeah from like people yeah from there. Um, so what what were some of the approaches that you had to take? What what kinds of um, changes have you had to make to navigate through this? Um, okay, so actually I am is within the COVID as well, we I'm, I'm the managing director who like uh, received the handover from the first MD mm -hmm. that she's been doing um like kick off like POC, like proof of concept for this uh, business in Thailand. So it's more like zero to one. And I'm mm -hmm. the person who started from one to hundred. Right. Okay. So, so it's double, it's like two X from there. Like okay, many changes to do in a time, make it survive and then how mm -hmm. to adjust all the process. To make it fit for scale, mm -hmm. yeah, so that that all is going together in in the situation, yeah. But but um, the first thing I do is actually start with people and culture. So just to clarify that, that's that's really interesting. So the way you 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 phrase it made it very clear too. Is sort of you're basically saying the person who was running the organization before it's similar to someone running um a, an a, an early stage or seed stage startup, right? So. Mm -hmm. They're doing what you call a proof of concept. In a sense, it's almost like it sounds like it was almost like the MVP for this country, right? Because you had operations somewhere else, they were already successful scaling. And then if someone was sent here to start it up, and so there's some degree of experimentation, testing, validation, and iterating to go through. But then when you came on board, that phase was basically done or, or ready to change, and you were in charge of 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 scaling it and going into a growth stage, an actual growth stage. Is, is that correct? Right, right. So I'm in the end phase of the early stage to, to the growth stage. Ah, very interesting. So did that require, so what kinds of changes did you have to make given, given that? Yep, so um, to, to give a big picture is that when, when first someone who, who proof of concept is that means in the easy term is that just make things happen. Mm -hmm. right just do anything to make it happen <laughs> but those kind of thing can be like non-systematic just just anything make it happen so it can be a mess later as well but that was the best thing to do because mm -hmm. we need to make it happen mm -hmm. right so um you can imagine that we need, would need a lot of process system the way of people thinking would would need to adjust with new way of working as well because if we still have the team with like okay i want to make this happen only and with the long-term thinking or like growth thinking 
it would ruin the, the whole process later on. So that's why people would be the very first thing, thing to do from, from the beginning. You said people would be one of the first things to do, is that correct? Yes, correct. So and people, so, uh -huh. yeah, people and the system, because like if the people are not ready and I want to do everything at the system and everything and people are not aligned, it's gonna fail, right? So we need everyone on board first. Okay. And so what, what um, uh, did you have sort of certain either frameworks or something did you have to do to, to, to guide them along in that path? Yep. Um, luckily, we have company cultures from, um, from headquarters. So um, first, we try to educate what's company cultures there. And then I have my own framework. It's called ASK, which is um, Attitude, Skill, and Knowledge. Hmm. So, so I have people on my mind who I want, what kind of attitude I want, what kind of attitude I don't want. This kind of is called toxic. This kind of skill is not, yes. it's not trainable. This kind of skill trainable and yep. knowledge. Yeah, so this became the, the main criteria on selecting people who's going to go and not go, right? But uh, in the end, we end with to input top 20 and remove bottom 20. I think I got the concept from uh, the book called Winnings from Jack Welch. Oh, Jack Welch, right? GE. Yep, yeah. yep. He's yeah, famous so, for, for that concept. Yep. Right, oh. so uh, this concept really works, actually. It's proof, it's um, make the big change within three months, and then the people sentiment changes very fast. So that's one of the th the first things that you did then was uh, eliminate the bottom bottom sort of uh, part of the the team and then beefed up the the top right. top players. Right. It's it's very hard for execution though. Um, I'm not that. <laughs> I'm 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 a shy person. I don't. No one likes to terminate people, right? But um, with the situation, everything COVID and this kind of thing, we need to do very fast hmm. to, to lean the team to make it. So to make it very efficient, that's the, the main goal with that quarter. And then one of the things that you just said a few moments ago was you, it was sort of your own methodology you brought into the picture you, uh, that you called ASK, right? You said attitude, skills, knowledge, knowledge. right? Yes. Um, so this resonates strongly with some sort of world best practices in management. Um, there's this notion that when you, when you in, hire someone and recruit, you can look kind of at it, this very simplistic equation. There's attitude times skill, but the multiplier on attitude is much, much higher. So sometimes someone can have the skill, but if the attitude's not there, it, it's not not worth it. Um, right. Is it is it similar? And then can you maybe even expand a little bit more on on, on the A part of your ASK and how how do you how do you sort of assess that? What are some additional things that you look for and and you know? Okay, so um, actually I, I got this one from, I think research on Google also see this framework very fast, uh, like, like you just mentioned. Yeah, attitude is one of the main factor because even the skill is not, is not good, but if the attitude is good, we, we, we would train and we would focus that and give them time to train. And if the, even that person's skill is very good, but the attitude is not good, I, I would not keep that person. Right, that's right. Yeah. So that, that's how I do it. So, but for for the growth stage, what we really looking for is people who um, have the ownership, like commitment, like they really want to grow the company together, like uh, want to generate uh, or contribute impact together, uh, proactive, ambitious, these people. But uh, one of the key value of Zenium is that uh, is grit and speed. So they must have this one for, for uh, driving company. Yes, excellent, excellent. And then, so now again, what some of the things that you just described, they, they sound like um, they describe how you started to execute the transition from this POC zero to one to the scaling growth stage, you know, one to a hundred, so to speak. Um, but then there's another element, which kind of is, is part of the genesis of this talk, which is COVID. So COVID is not about the phase, it's just about this fact of life, this immense thing that's happened in our world. And so what were the some specific responses that you had to do and, and your strategies for, for dealing with um, uh, COVID in particular? Yeah, so what we actually look at first is like to lean down our business as we can, right? with the situation first, and then we see what was next after we the, the business is lean. So imagine like this, um, we have a lot of fat in our body, 
we just have to lean and make it come today. So that's the key thing. But what's the internet? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But what would be the main path for the business, right? So we have uh, to identify what is the main path for our business. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's how I started. So actually, marketing and payroll is the two main path of the business. Mm -hmm. That's why it's going to go back to people that how I do. And the second thing would be marketing. Marketing and payroll. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you elaborate on that? First, first starting with payroll. When you say payroll, do you, what, 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 are you, what do you mean exactly? Just want to make sure. Um, payrolls like uh, salary, head count. Okay. Okay. In general, right? So your overall head count. Okay. Yes. yes. So let's go back to what we just mentioned, like remove bottom 20 and lean and then, okay, uh, no bonus, no increment. That, that I think is very normal for every company since last year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And and with that, we, we in, input the talent, but the talent sometimes that I input in maybe have a bit higher salary than the old one, but that one would generate more revenue to cover that expense. So that would be the concept of hiring. Yeah, but for uh, for marketing, um, so let's say first like our main business doing online marketing, uh, mm -hmm. off, offline marketing with um, clinic partners because we have like 100 clinic partners in, in Thailand for Slim Room. Mm -hmm. But we don't we but we don't have much expense there, just like POSM, like a pile of material sales there. Just that. So the main 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 thing would be marketing. And then we have to really dig deep in the marketing structure on like awareness, consideration, conversion step on how much should we spend on each one was the ROI, is it worth it at that moment? So we have mm -hmm. to monitor very close. Just it it's gonna go back to data and then estimation okay how much we should spend how much we're going to get is it worth it or we just cut it out and then we're still able to control our burn rate in the end mm -hmm. so that so when you say that and then together with what you just how you described your methodology even from earlier in your career you're very analytical data driven right so now if i put that together with what you just said about these um i'll call it the various parts of the funnel if you will your marketing funnel right um so to be able to tune that funnel in some way, in this analytical way, would imply that you have you have numbers behind it. So, are you able to measure each of those things? The kind of uh, uh, I forget the terms that you just use, but but like you know the the various parts. You actually have conversion rates or something like that that you can use in your process. Yes. Um... In, in in here we have like all the step like not just sales process not sales level but from marketing level to payments we have all the step in a very small step like from lead to opportunities to past placement appointments so every step is like trackable and we have all the numbers behind in like data studios like on google analytics or or even in sales process we're using so every step we have the data to to analyze and we can track even like from which channel which content it is so we can see right away if that content we we just post that is it efficient or not does we is it um convert well from the main objective or it just got engagement yeah that's that's how we do and we also monitor like okay what's the cost per list cost per opportunity just like how other marketing agency do mm -hmm. so are all the parts of this the funnel that you described are they all do they all have online touch points so that you you have electronic data yeah that's right Right. Okay. Okay. So it's an all online funnel. All right. And so, um, so you had to make some decisions there. So again, the context here is you were talking about trimming the fat and the fat was in largely in payroll and marketing. So it sounds like part of what you reduced in marketing was sort of optimizing of your, your inputs or your expenses into your, well, your inputs into the, your funnels. So does that mean like you spent less on certain parts of the funnel and spent more on others? based on this analysis then? Yes, so we, we spend less in some channel or we just stop running it and then we spend something more to produce for a longer term. But for like example, we stop off for conversion because we cannot convert anything, but we mm -hmm. would um, focus more in engagement or awareness to keep people know about our brands. So that's how we do. So we shift the way on how we utilize the budget. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, and I heard you use the word channel there too. You, in some cases, you might've changed channels or emphasize or de-emphasize certain channels, which is different from where in the funnel, right? It's like, you can have multiple funnels. So 
correct. Okay. So, so in general, like just for example, Google, Facebook, Instagram, um, mm -hmm. website, uh, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, right? So we have many channels, and each channel have uh, might have different way of like uh to get leads in in the yeah. different way. Yeah. Definitely. Now that's something. I mean, that's something that we have to do when we're running a business or a startup, regardless of COVID, right? It's a sort of uh, marketing optimization, various forms of A-B testing, growth hacking, if you will, right? Um, so you, 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 you've already did that anyways, to some extent, but was there a change then in the way in doing this specifically because of COVID? Is it like, did COVID impact the mix and, and, and force you to have to make these changes? Yes, so we mainly um, scale down like more than 80% in conversion in Facebook. And we started to focus more in like um, inbound marketing, like uh -huh. SEO or like um, uh, referral from clinics. So we start approaching lots of doctors, um, increase relationship with them or how we do um, in the other way, like, okay, we go back to our old KLs and then how we're gonna reutilize the materials or how, like affiliate kind of things. So we mm -hmm. do lots of, lots of um, initiatives on, on doing that one, but just let um, performance marketing on Facebook. I think that will be the main thing because I believe in most of the online business, like 80, more than 80, 90%, they run the budget on this paid for performance only. Mm -hmm. And did you have to run a lot of experiments? Because, you know, at least from my own direct experience with uh, digital marketing, it's not always like you don't just make one change and you're done. You have to kind yes. of test assumptions. So was there a lot of experimentation in your case? Yeah, it's a lot of experimentation and also the methodology, uh, like how should we educate people in line platform as well. So we go uh, like focus more in like um, educating channel for for users in line or how we're gonna do more app push on our applications. So we we or we like um go to restructure our website. Like right now our website is on restruct like renovating. We hope to finish this like by two four. So we we try to review lots of things that we need to fix. So it's a good time for us to fix and then we just go in in other things like okay we we had like testimonial campaigns last month to, to try to launch and then educate pain points those kind of thing instead of like conversion so mm. we, we try to to solve that issue solve the concerns and then when they join the pipeline like okay they became leads and then sales have a time like a faster time to convert the customer so the cycle time would be less when we educate more ah okay okay very interesting how about with regards to um, margins? Uh, I think if I remember correctly from talking with you before, is that some sort of strategy regarding margins as well? Um, so more like EBITDA, right? So burn rate. So it's, it's the burn rate, I think. So the, the main main GBI, the main thing is like to trim the fat. So we trim everything to make it lean. So to see how it, it, it's lean already. So we see the burn rate. So mm -hmm. we have the certain number of the burn rate that, okay, if that this one, so it's efficient already. Yeah. So basically you're saying you had to reduce the burn rate. Right. And was it basically in what you just described, which are these various some elements of your marketing funnel, if you will, and also headcount? Yes. Is that oh, okay. so this are two main things that um, made the, the burn rate is like get better, right? The the rest would be like, okay, your costs and maybe you cannot do much because you try to optimize it already. The other thing is more like very minor things that can do in the business. But I think believe in the loss of business, these are the two main factors that uh, is the, the main platform for the business, yeah. Got it, got it. Um, and how about uh, sort of how you dealt with COVID from more of a, a people level? So with employees uh, and sort of their, for lack of a better term, relationship to COVID, is there anything you had to do or you, you chose to do to help them in, in that regard? Yeah. Um, so we, we have like a normal town hall with just like others, right? And then what I'm trying to do is that I try to educate the frameworks on how I do, like I, I like more like design thinking the way I think mm -hmm. to the team. So I, I would not expect everyone to be like me, but I would like everyone to at least have basic design thinking on how they set up question, how they're curious on mm -hmm. what they're doing today, what can be improved. So I'm trying to set this like see this on on everyone's minds that okay they they are like everyone in the company can contribute impact because i always tell the team that like our team very small and then 
you just you moving a little bit that the business can move as well you can grow the business by yourself so i i i ask them to at least ask question be curious on what they're doing and then ask them if it's what they're doing today can be improved or not so just like um, the set zero thing right even you did improve a lot of things in the past but if you cut those out and then you think today just now mm -hmm. is it able to improve or not is it good yet with this what we expecting even if improve a lot but it's still not that good so okay what's wrong with that we need to start thinking dig down and then improve from that yeah so it's it's a it's sort of um continuous improvement really you're right. really pushing that right, right. And, and and you said design thinking but did you actually did you formally introduce some sort of uh, either like a mini training or how, how did you how did you try to inject design thinking specifically okay um i'm not the master here but um, that's okay that's good. <laughs> that's a, that's a thing. <laughs> yeah but like just the basic like root cause analysis framework right five mm -hmm. why things ah. um you know uh they and 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 the way I work with them is that when anyone come to me and then complain or something, I would like, so what next? And why is bad? And I would not allow it. And then I'm like, give me the data. If no data, you cannot say good or bad. Just give me the data. So I always force them back. Like, okay, give me the data and then we discuss. Or after the day, after the second phase of having data, I would ask them like, okay, give me the plan and then we debate. So I keep encouraging this kind of level of the people step by step. Wow. Wow. Okay. And then how about, how about an, on the kind of um, human interaction uh, in, a, in a less sort of formal level? So, you know, because during COVID, a lot of us, we don't see each other. There's the whole work from home thing. Any, any kind of measures that you took to try to yeah. help your team deal with that? Uh, yeah. So we have online lunch or mostly <laughs> like online drinking in the night. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of drinking? <laughs> <laughs> any drinks okay yeah we any drinks um with games so we have small games with that not not that often but we we have it and also the campaign like from from the team like we say like get to know you better so we pairing up people from different team like hmm. one by one just like a buddy right yeah. so every two weeks they're gonna have new buddy and then we expect them to talk about anything that not related to work or related nice to nice Oh, I'm actually, I'm really happy to hear that because I, I was thinking of doing something like that with even my own team. So you've actually done it. Can, can you describe, uh, just tell me a little bit more. So you, did you actually, did you randomly connect people to, with each other? And then was it like, was that their buddy forever or do you, do you rotate or how do you do that? We actually rotate them every two weeks. Ah. So, so it's random, but sometimes I sneakily <laughs> at him. Yeah, and they might hurt it if, if some, anyone joined, but yeah, sometimes I'm sneaking to, to do it because I think these people should talk and might be better to contribute something. So I'm just tell my HR to listen to this one. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And and you said you and actually like eat. So is it sort of like having lunches together, that kind of thing, literally like that? Yeah, have lunches or, or they um, talk on the phone after work, those kind of things. So I, I try to create the environment after work, like, and remember that people talk together, but not about mainly about work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not and about work or about yeah. work? Try, not, try to not about work. Not so they about. have more like people, you know, talking because like um, it started like second or third month after we work from home already. I, we start since it like talk, always talk about work. And then after that, we feel alone and then stressed out. So this kind of thing helped them a lot. Like, okay talk about anything that not related to work or just random call. So sometimes I random call my team and they're like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm calling and then just talk about anything for one or two hours. And just random. Yeah. That's great. That's really good. Wow. I, I got to try some of this too myself. It sounds really good. Oh, one um, thing we have to call um, Crazy Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> so so what we're doing is that um, the, the HR, are we, we going to set the theme like, okay, we just like okay, we're gonna wear the um, sleepwear today. We're gonna act like um, um, we uh, we just coming up with our own waters, or we just have to dress um, crazy with the theme that they set, or airplane, or the pet day. We show up our pets, so it's like a crazy Wednesday because like every morning we have a morning call, right? Everyone will be in the call for the company, so yeah, that that call like to start up the day. 
That's that's a great idea. So it's sort of like a dress up theme kind of thing. Yes. And then since we're on Zoom, you you just doesn't even have to be your whole your whole you know all, your whole wardrobe. <laughs> it can be just the top half. <laughs> the top <laughs> It could be just a hat or whatever. Okay, that's cool. Very cool. I've never, I've never heard that. That's a really great idea. And how about, how about um things? Re I think I remember you talking about like either offsites or something um, like OKRs right. for team, team building, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, actually, this one we have for management team. Um, mm -hmm. even myself with board, right? So in in Sanyum, we actually have eight markets in Asia like um, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Taiwan, yeah. Hong Kong, um, Singapore. So Macau and like egg, with egg markets. So it's we've been apart for almost two years already. So yeah. we, we call off, okay, offsite, but it's like online. So it's like three days, right? Meeting and then yeah. we have workshop. And then sometimes I got some some um, cool, fun stuff from there. And then I also implement to the Thai team as well, like with our OK offsite. So what we do is like one day strategy, like for quarter review, and then the strategy, what we're going to do next, the second day, what we did is like more people engagement to understand more about our cultures and the session, like the hero session that we talk about our life experience and then how we became hero from that challenge and how, how we all come from those challenge. And then it, it mm -hmm. increased more like um, deeper engagement with the team. And then they, after that, they feel like more like free to talk with those people in the team more excellent yeah. so that's that's like personal life experience right okay. this is not okay okay it's a really a form of deeper ice breaking um and then again you said this is within the management team is that correct right, right. like management team talent would be from like senior level to manager yeah. excellent excellent okay and then um um you, I think you also said something about like contrasting uh, the the POC phase of the team versus sort of before and after. There's some certain changes. There's some contrast in 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 the culture of the team that 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 you noticed or that you created. Um, something having to do with sort of silos. Either in one phase there was more silos, and and then the other or something like this. Yeah. So it like. Um... It, it came when I started this one, right, from the POC. So people, back to the concept that make it happen. So mm -hmm. when make it happen, everyone just try to get that things done, right? So not much collaboration. So people just like, okay, in, in partnership, just, okay, I'm done with this. Operation, I'm done with this. Sell, I'm done with this. Marketing, I'm done with this. But no one talking to each other. Mm. I'm like, I just get my things done. I'm achieved on my things. It's not really collaborative. They might just talk a little bit if they really need, but sometimes when people talk to each other, they might feel offended. They don't feel like they are one team to grow together. That's I think that's the, the thing. Okay. That. But that time was a good thing, right? To just make it happen. During the POC period, during the, right. the zero to one. So that's that's the situation or the environment you came into. Right. But then you had to deliberately change that. Um. Uh, I mean, is that what you see? Like that's one of the key, uh, key factors to be able to go into more of a growth and scaling stage that you need You need less silos, is that the case? True, we need to remove it. We need to remove silos and then people need to, um, how it's called, synergy. So we mm -hmm. need lots of synergy among the department because lots of projects, it cannot, it cannot happen without a collaborative in the, mm -hmm. among the teams. So that, that's how, from from there, right? So remove people have talent, go with the so we in, input lots of people who have ownership and we really want to grow a business together. After the good people came, the the water became lighter from the dark one, right? Mm. So filter is getting filtered. Understand. So, yeah, that, that's how it happened. And then we we start to one person start to three people start. So everyone's starting to okay, let's help each other. First, it's not that right away so we have to set up among department meeting at least they must have one one on one meeting like okay from sales marketing talk to each other sales partnership sales operation operation do the same thing operation partnership operation sales operation marketing this kind of thing so every department got a chance to talk with each other and after a while just okay every department talk to talk together and then after that we have just set one topic and then everybody just jump into this 
um, it choose a problem and then we solve it right away together. Mm -hmm. as Excellent. So I, I do have other questions, but I see that we have some questions from our audience. So I, I want to kind of honor that, you know, really grateful for them asking before before we even, you know, get to the Q&A. So let's let's actually check them out and see if we can um, address some of them now. Um, so I uh, see here, let's see, from, from Alex says, uh, sounds like the perfect service for the COVID age. Was it designed with the pandemic in mind? <laughs> So he's asking basically is this business model or this this type of tech you know approach that Zenium does was, was I don't know if that's more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> it does seem perfect for COVID, right? Because you don't have to go into the doctor all the time. It's only three, three visits. Um, we have from some an anonymous attendee. Uh, how do you deal with the resistance, uh, for example, rumors ah, among employees? Due to big change, for example, layoff. Oh, excellent oh. question. Mm. Yeah, actually, the first month I became MD, I was like almost give up every right. day for a month. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard. It's it's not easy at all. Um, I actually ask myself a lot if like I should I because in the first phase I try to compromise myself, act myself like the past MD, like the character, mm. because my character is not someone who really go follow everyone you know not kind sweet talk i'm not that kind of person at all i'm, I'm really that that driven person result oriented person mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so very opposite so uh, yeah first thing i actually i talk with founders i thank to julian again he's a very nice guy like okay so this one actually taught me uh about leadership, you know, when, when the leader trusts you on who you are. So it's really encouraged me to become who I am. So it's mm -hmm. so empowered. And I got empowered from his, his work. And, and then after that, I became more confident on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I actually doesn't care much because in, in my past experience, as I was in sales director before with 40 sales, I got lots of resistance already. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I became like um, more resistant from there. So, um, I I felt, but I I just try to not listen too much because just focus on my goal and focus on what I'm doing. Am I going to the right direction? Hmm. And then I I try to think is that okay if I go to that right right direction, uh, my motivation and everything is correct. And the per person or people who still very resistant, and I try to educate and it's not follow. Maybe it's a very good time for them to go. Mm. <laughs> so just let go even the very good person just need to let go but if that that position is not replaceable at that moment so i'm gonna try to maintain until i find a better one to replace mm. <laughs> see uh, i'm a good person i'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> but in that situation no choice right everything is pressured a lot already with lean and everything so i have to make sure. it fast I actually got this KPI to restructure the whole team in three months and I'm like too fast. So I'm like, okay, maybe six months is better. Mm. Yeah. So, 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 that, so what you just explained, I mean, it's very valuable because I, it, let, let me check if I understand correctly. I think from part of, of the advice that you got and how you, you dealt with the situation, again, with like people being negative and toxic with rumors and things like that. The first thing I got from your answer is that it's about, it's, it's an, it's an, internal thing that you have to do not external it's not about like tactically trying to fix someone or change someone's behavior but it's it's your how you will handle it and your strength to be able to deal with it and to some extent like have to be able to to um not be impacted by it too much right is, is that correct is that part of what you're, you're basically saying right. correct yeah okay. because at first i try to to fix those kind of external and then is misleading is make me go nowhere right and mm. then i'm going to shift that plan very fast so i have to scale this market i have no choice understand okay. understand okay but yeah that was a great question um uh and, and great answer thank you so let's see another one how do you motivate or encourage people to do beyond um whoops it's moving hang on to do beyond what they can do at the current stage any trick or good learning from what you have done? So motivating people to 
basically grow past the part that where they are now? To be honest, I'm not that good to to give this uh like you know suggestion that much. But um, what I'm trying to do right now is that um I, I always believe in my team. Like the person who in charge in that position is mean that they already expert or specialized in that position in certain level, right? So I always I trust them first. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I will have one on one check in with them. Like, okay, if they really know all the data or the movement, I will ask them and then they will give me the feedback on how they do. Um, after I'm sure that, that um, they know, so just let them do it and then they will come back to propose the plan and then we debate. I, I'm trying to act as like um, a trainer, like a consult. Mm -hmm. Coaching. Like a right? Coaching, yeah. Coaching. So Excellent. I'm trying to coach on that one. But some, some people at the level, the level that able, to receive the coaching, I will start to coach. But if not, I will just order them to do. It. But if mm -hmm. they are growing time by time, after order them to do it, they will start to think more, and then I will start to step back because I'm the person that not really. I don't like micromanagement, but I I hate to do it. But I have to do it from very start to make sure that everyone understand and know what they do in fundamental level. After that, I'm just let it go, and then in the end, just trust them what they doing, give a suggestion, mm -hmm. and let them have their ownership is it's more about empower right so yes. empower them in the certain level from like recruit the team let go of the team or anything yeah mm. what you just described is very aligned with something called situational leadership um and so the principle is that there's a spectrum of how the the leadership style that a manager has with 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 their team or with a particular person and it, when someone is very new at something, and that doesn't mean just for their whole role, but it could be a particular skill or context. If they're new at it and they need help, um, then sometimes it's you need to be more directive as the manager. So what you're kind of saying, you know, tell them what to do, but that's basically being more directive. And over time, as they get more competency and more confidence, you can become a, more of a coach, you know, and and more supportive rather than directive. That's exactly. that's my interpretation. Is it would that be fair to say? Yeah, correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. okay, very cool. Excellent. Another question we have. Um, were were there any big conflicts among different teams? Wow, in the organization that could impact on the business performance, and how did you deal with um, collaboration or make them uh, to become one team? Mm. Yeah. It, it is and it happened before it became minor and minor day by day um sometimes i even have to ask regional team to support this to talk with the the person who may have issues and then try to understand have a better understanding from as many as perspective as i can just like some same way as collecting data right just get more <laughs> opinion from others as i can and then see what we can do first sometimes i would ask like um site manager or like co-managers co from regional to talk or like I talk or we have more sync, uh, sync uh, meeting with among department or what I even done is that um, we launched the survey on how difficulties to work with this department and by ranking with all departments so I have to do it monthly. Whoa. And Wait, then who, I'm who, to... who, who ranked that? Who gave the, the ranking? <laughs> Everyone, everyone doing the ranking. Really? And I'm, and I'm the only one behind to see which department is hardest department to work with. Very interesting. This is something that you initiated or is it something yeah. in, that exists in, really? Yeah. Because wow. it, it was a very, very big thing in, in the company, in that situation. So that's why I have to team up with this one and then try to monitor. But I, I, I don't talk, like we not announce this to, to the whole team, but the top three, I will just talk to that team specifically and like, okay, give them a big heads up. Or I don't tell them, but like, okay, I would ask them more on what they're doing or what's wrong. Because sometimes we got the backfire from, from this one and then top talent uh, mm -hmm. leave the company because of this kind of difficulty to work among the teams. Mm -hmm. Wow, but very impressive. I mean, you, you're very, very, um... You're, you're using your creativity, you are truly experimenting and, and data driven and, uh, and, and just, oh, just to even like relate this back to the person who asked the question, right? So it sounds like part of your answer is that um, how, 
you know, what happened when you dealt with, when you you had uh, groups of employees that had conflicts with each other. So what you demonstrated is you actually you asked for help. You reached out to other people, other sort of fellow managers in your organization, not only locally but regionally, and um, which is a big deal. Some people, whether it's because of pride or comfort, uh, you know, comfort zone, whatever it may be. They, they might not do that or might forget to do that, but you you syst very systematically did that and, and then did these measures. That's really impressive. Okay. Ah, super cool. Um, and then let's see what else here. We've got, uh, how do you handle talented person ooh, with a toxic mindset? <laughs> talented person with toxic mindset? Yeah. Um, Luckily, I don't have that much. So mostly people like mother <laughs> not that super talented people. I, I don't, I, I, I don't, not saying that our team is not good, but like not so, so very high talented. Um, luckily, we don't, don't, don't have that kind of super toxic in, in the company with that mm. level of people. Mm. Um, but yeah, if, if that happened, what I will do is the same. I will ask the regional to talk with, um, get more comments from like environments. So what I will do is that I will talk with many staff in many departments and ask the feedback from about that person. Or like I will ask HR to, to get the feedback from me. Or I will ask the person in the team or someone like, hmm. you know, act like a detective and then get the real thing for me. Because sometimes when I talk to the staff in the team or their hmm. friends, they might not say the truth to you. That's because right. I'm, I'm, I'm the very high level, so no one's going to tell the truth to me. They'll be like, okay, everything is good. No need to worry. Yeah, yep. Or like, okay, I might heard something wrong there, but I don't want to say what it is. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do, I have to send people to go around and get the real thing, what is happening, and then fix yep. what is there. Yep, yeah. makes sense. All right, and then we have someone who's talking about the your sort of hard science, or it's related to your hard science background originally. They said, um, for people with only hard science slash engineering background, is it necessary for them to go to M for MBA? Um, especially ones who found a company and have to play a role in business management. Um, uh, would be great to have your opinion from you having both a science and MBA degree. Great question. Um, actually, for me, as an MBA, I got at that time, it just translate my language from scientist to a normal person. <laughs> I got nothing from MBA. To be honest, because Whoa. when I started right away in startup, right, it's nothing like you can apply in corporates, right? Mm. It's like learning by doing, mm. mostly hundred percent. And then when I look back now, they say, okay, maybe some framework I actually learned from MBA, at, but I remember nothing. Mm. I know okay, like basic terms in finance and then accounting, but very basic things like basic synonyms like import. Um, export those kind of thing is very very basic uh, but I don't really get much from MBA it's just able to talk um, to be a little bit it's like you know how to do shit well <laughs> running business that's all to be a good MBA student is you know how good to to act as a presenter in the presentation how to convince people right so not much there for for me for me and not for others I'm sorry I'm so sorry but yeah we'll, we'll have to go I back and like censor that part since this is being done at a business school. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No, 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 no. <laughs> because um, I cannot pick up that much because I, I was in biotech for eight years and then to, to have fast track in MBA for you is too fast. But mm -hmm. for me right now, maybe next few years, I would go back and take MBA again. Like maybe later on, I would apply for such MBA next three years or five years. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's the right time already to, to apply on my experience with the coursework. But that time I start too fast, so I got nothing. Only uh, just the language. No, that, that makes sense. And that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of business schools would would encourage, you know, that the students go get some experience before they come. Sometimes they even require it because it, it'll be better for the student, you know, for the exact reason that you said that like the they've had they've had the direct hands-on experience and there's a context to learn some other stuff that can then be be useful. Yeah. I, I would encourage the people who have high sense or engineer background to if they 
about to do that one startup, just do it and then learn by doing. Yes. Just collect lots of best practice from what they do because nowadays startup is not even in MBA coursework. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna teach you. So just well, say, except mine. Ah, <laughs> 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 So, so just apply for a team because like most of the MBA now is not much, right? So it's not really up, up to date right now. So I think, yeah, we need to to do more than learn. And then we maybe we can take some short, short course or online courses from there. And then, and then, yeah, that would help. Yeah. And I, I also encourage to work and then study later. We have a question from Kun, uh, let's see. Sorry if I don't pronounce it right because I can't totally see it either. So, so, so Kun, I think. Um, what is the goal of Zenyum Thailand for the next year? Um, has this goal, uh, does it have to get along with the regional goal or can you kind of go after your own goal basically? Mm, so, mm. Our goal is to uh, scale our business, right? But right now, it's very situation depends on COVID. Mm. Like, um, actually, we plan to scale this year, and with now, I think we have to slow down and prepare like the foundations and do all the things we can do first, and next year we back to scale. Mm. So they they give us a very broad thing to do. Okay, so it's just scale. So how you gonna scale is all about me. Like, okay, what I wanna scale. Mm. Right. So basically we wanna scale with aligners as well. So we wanna become more like well known in our brands, like send you aligners. So mm. send you invisible braces. So we want to to be more well known on this one. Mm-hmm. And also with like our consumer brand and consumer products. That's what we, we we want to do. Yeah. I think the with that actually it's also still aligned with the original way we, we follow in in one direction but mm-hmm. they also give you a small room on what you want to do first what you want to scale like in terms of the execution they just let it be uh, let it um, up to decide for for the md in each market to to fit with the the market because for example in hong kong the way we do um sonic toothbrush might do with um uh, scale with one one way like pop-up store those kind of mm-hmm. things but then you in thailand like we might just go with clinic partners um mm-hmm. dental partners or drug stores mm-hmm. we, we might want to to expand things in different way of doing the business yeah, yeah. good good excellent and then finally we have a question from kun salita um asking both of us actually uh, one question. I assume your team is working from home. Is the productivity increased or not, and how? Mm. For me, um, the productivity for teams from working from home is not changed at all, or even a bit increasing. Um, because we, we don't really go anywhere. And like um, from the first two to three months that we work from home, okay, we, we work from home almost half years already. We've been switching work from home since the beginning of the year, so it's been very long for our team. Um, so we have morning calls. So every every day nine thirty, we everyone must get in the call, tell them tell tell us like what they're gonna do today, the plans, and then when the end of the day, everyone will just go and like update what they have been done in the day. But after it became routine, so we removed the end of the day meeting out and then just morning call. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we 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 fo- uh, focus on that and then some some team and then I also let each team to have their way on on working. For example, like the operation team, they may ask every team member to to write up summarize for each day like PPP like problem plan mm-hmm. progress right for for the team members like any errors any highlights they, they they want us to know but some team they just update on slack so everyone have to be online so the productivity is not decreased i think because like we also work very close with regional team in singapore and and then we just feel kind of used to it already before we start work from home so everyone just always like connected with other markets online got it and then so, uh, just to answer for, from my uh, from our end, um, same thing. Uh, yes, I, I, at least my opinion is the productivity is higher. Um, I've heard not only from my own team but people in general that that co- working from home tends to, to end up with them working harder or more. <laughs> they do more stuff, and I think it increases the speed of work. I mean, meetings can happen much more easily, more frequently. Um, 
and we've we've yeah we've gone pretty nuts with with that in some of some of our projects so yep <laughs> it does have a downside which is the human side which is a part of what you talked about important earlier you know relationships bonding and i think that's that's an important thing that's unfortunately that i think that's that's the downside so it's not a direct productivity thing but it can affect productivity in, at another level, right? Be based on quality of relationships. And that's why I was so interested in hearing some of the creative things that you Numfon, are, are, have been doing to address that in this, in this environment. And then we have what I think is one last one is, what's the most challenging factor to work with um, ah, in working with international startup company? Uh, pros and cons. I know you, you've got a lot of experience with this, right? Through your through your career, so yeah. So the uh, challenge working with the uh, uh, regional international team, right? Uh, ch yeah, challenges and pros and cons too. So both good and good and bad. Um, I think for me, it's more about I don't want to be like um racist, but every nationalities have a different way of working because mm -hmm. I was working with Vietnamese. Indian, now it's German, Singaporean. So it's very, very different and that they have their own style of working. But um, right now, I think we very international company because we have more than 10 nationalities in the company, even with only eight markets. Um, what is pros is that, um, so we, we don't just go like, okay, this is time, Thai thing, this is Vietnamese thing, this is Singaporean thing. We, we don't go with that one. Mm -hmm. We just respect everyone as like a normal people in certain level and like, okay, um, try to understand what they do, learn from their logic. We really open um, on other, how, how they do. So lots of time I got help from talking with other MDs in other markets or even when I was head of sales in Thailand before last year and then I just talk with head of sales in Singapore, head of sales of Taiwan, how, how they do with this, are they having this issue as well? And then just they just share right away. We don't have the competition among markets. Mm. Like, okay, I want to keep my own knowledge and don't share, but they just share. Sometimes we even have like a role play, like in sales, we have the role play from Singapore and Thai team and then role play the script on how, how they do it, how they close the deal. So that's oh, how we- Great. Yeah. Very so, cool. <laughs> This is how I really like it here in, in, in the international environment. Um, but con sometimes, yeah, it's sometimes too far away. Like it's, it's not became con before COVID, but it started to be like this because we cannot fly, right? Mm -hmm. And some some small issues that you want those people in regional or headquarters team to notice on it, they might not understand about that deeply because, because they're not here. So it's a bit harder to communicate and make them understand what is going on and the, it also go with a lot of trust. You know, they have to really trust us on, on what is happening here and then just listen one side or they have to collect data from other sides. It's a bit harder from there. Like mm. when, when we need help um, some, constantly, sometimes it's quite hard. Like example, public holidays. Today is public holiday in Singapore. We may need some issue, some something to solve it out, but might not able to do. So many, many holidays, that's not the same, right? Mm. So that's that, not nothing big. And more, more for me is like pros on on that part. It's very supportive team. We we even even we compete to get higher revenue in the market, but we never um hide out things. What is the best practice for our markets? Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so definitely in in sort of sum, it's uh, definitely hearing more pros than cons. It's a lot of pros. Okay. Um, I think we're, we should be really wrapping up now. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, so since it's uh, 7.44, I see one last question. Maybe we can, we, can, we can squeeze it in for a really short version. So I'll ask it quickly. Healthcare is a restricted industry. How do you, uh, as a healthcare startup, overcome the restriction? <laughs> I don't know if that's a short answer question though. <laughs> it's it's very hard. Um actually like we also have to import some some of our product as well, right? Our, our invisible braces we have to import. We we don't we we not really produce here. Um majority will import so a lot of restriction from FDA. Mm. Even a lot of time um 
we updated with the latest update regulation from FDA and then oh wow they might launch a new one and then it's not so sometimes we have to pay fine mm. on that one it's, it's very very hard on doing that um for import exporting the other thing would be um websites apps uh is very hard for us to do so if, for example we cannot do comparison with competitors on website uh, cannot do right. before after um yeah. like it's a lot of restriction on that so we have to really find a way to tweak the message and let people understand on on how we want to deliver or we have to select the right platform on how we want to educate that people that's in, right in that platform so for example we cannot educate this thing right away in Facebook or website. So we, we have to convince them to add a platform and then convert. Yeah, very true. Healthcare has a huge problem. A lot of people don't realize sometimes the marketing for healthcare is not, you can't just do what you would normally do for a regular product uh, because of FDA yeah. restrictions. So, yeah. Okay, I think that's that's it. Um, uh, before I pass it back to Raphael, I just, I just wanted to say, to the audience too, um, thank you so much. Uh, you, you asked some really wonderful questions and they provide a great opportunity to draw out these also um, equally wonderful insights from, from Numphorn. And, and thank you so much, Numphorn. I really, I, I, have to, I just have to say, because I, I know I've sort of tracked your career in a sense, we've, we've, we've talked throughout your journey and I'm uh, really, really um, uh, so delighted to see, you know, where, where you've, you've already, gotten to and from this conversation alone you just I just see the evidence so strongly can't wait to see what happens in the next five and then 10 years and more going forward so thank you so much yeah thank you so much for having me I'm, I'm really happy to have a chance to share share this um you know practice and uh like share the pain to to people here in the call and then I'm really happy for the questions. Um, if, if anyone would want to connect more, we can find on LinkedIn or like send you fan page. I, I'm not sure, but like, yeah, <laughs> can, we can connect from there. And then I, I would love to um, help if I can support for anything. Uh, always love to share and always love to help people who need help right now. I really understand that we all need help and then we have to go do this together. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.